Welcome to the only place where real, raw, and vulnerable conversations happen with IFBB Bikini Pros to give you an inside look at their struggles, strategies, mindset, passions, and all of life beyond the stage. This podcast is made to inspire, motivate, and remind competitors and the average gym goer that even the most extreme lifestyles and elite athletes have their ups and downs. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I'm your host, Celeste Rains turk and now it's time for the Confessions of a Bikini Pro podcast. Today's guest is not just a recent IFBB Bikini Pro and fitness enthusiast, but she's also a surfer on the Olympic team for Greece who is working to achieve a qualification for the 2028 Surfing Olympics. She is a professor in computer science and math at the University of California, Santa Cruz with her PhD from UC Berkeley in theoretical computer science. Welcome to the show and Alexandra Cola, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks. <laughs> Good. I'm happy you're here. here. Yeah, Yeah. I'm happy you're here too. And I'm grateful for your time. And obviously, I'm excited to jump into everything. You have an extensive background and an amazing athletic um, drive in you. So before we jump into all of that, I like to ask if there's anything you do or maybe think about right before your heel hits the stage. That question. (laughs) Uh (laughs) I don't do anything for myself, I guess, but when we're standing in line, I usually like chat with the girls and it's almost like chatting, like in a normal setting, like I would make friends at a coffee shop kind of thing. And then they call our class or whatever. And I'm like, oh shit, I have to put my heels on because I've been chatting all this time, you know, kind (laughs) of thing. So it's almost forgetting. I guess I make friends is what I do before my kids. Yeah, that's awesome. Have you maintained a lot of those friendships too or keep in touch? Yeah, actually, um, keep in touch for sure. And then like one of my friends, we didn't meet in line because we just competed at the same show together. Um, we're like, she's one of my best friends now. Uh, and we only met a year ago, uh, Vanessa. And that's hi, so Vanessa, cool. if you're listening. <laughs> I'm sure she is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, definitely maintaining those friendships. Yeah. That's super awesome. I think that that's one of the most valuable things about this sport is because it's such a niche thing. It's very niche to body build and it takes up a lot of time, energy, effort. It's a consistent effort too. Not a lot of people do it. Not a lot of people get it. So when you meet people who do, it's really nice to have those friendships in your life. Yeah, it's been it's been actually one of my favorite things. I mean, I love and hate a lot of things about it. <laughs> so it's it's kind of like always as with everything I think or most things in life, there's a lot to love and a lot to hate about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so so yeah, friendships is definitely one of the things, uh the positives. What are some of the things that maybe you don't love as much about it? So there are a few things um it's not necessarily that everyone that bodybuilds has those aspects. The one thing I hate is like the glam. Oh, I am yeah. a surfer. I walk barefoot. <laughs> I literally did not put foundation on my face for my wedding. When I did my makeup, I'm like, please do not paint my face. Yeah. You know? So the makeup is just like, I cannot handle it. It's so bad for me. Mm-hmm. Which is, you know, a lot of people like getting this, but for me, it's just my worst nightmare, literally. <laughs> I can't do this. Please get me out of here. Uh, so I guess the glam is one of the things I hate about it. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing is that it depends, like, why you do it. And I feel like if you do it for the right reasons, there's nothing to hate. But I feel like some people, not necessarily in bikini, but in general, uh, do it for the wrong reasons, and that becomes unhealthy and dangerous sometimes. So I have friends that, uh, you know, in either, you know, divisions, maybe like all they want is to build as much muscle as possible, and then they're like on 10,000 drugs, and that becomes really detrimental for their health. And then like they realize it years after, but then there's nothing mm-hmm. you can do about it. Or other people do it just to look a certain way, and that can become unhealthy on its own. So these things are the things I don't like, even though to fully 
like be honest, I started doing this two years ago, actually. I know not, yeah. I knew nothing about bodybuilding two years before. Yeah. And I started doing this because like, oh, they look cool. You know, maybe yeah. let me do, but it's, it wasn't more like a focus. It was more, oh, that's cool. You know, let's, let's try. But I stayed in it because actually my favorite thing about it, I know we talked about what I hate, which I already said, but my favorite thing about it is that it taught me that failure is the beginning and not the end. Mm. And that wow. I really appreciate because for me, like, you know, you don't win, whatever, you don't get your pro card or, you know, someone is better than you in whatever the judges thing is better. And you could take it very personally, be like, oh, my structure sucks. My body sucks. Like I suck, whatever. But I feel like, and I felt like this the first time, you know, in my first national show, I think I came fourth or something. I forget. Um, and I was like, oh, what's wrong with me? You know, what, you know, all of that stuff that everybody asks. But then throughout thinking about it and saying, okay, what can I make better? What can I work on and how to do that? It taught me that, yeah, failure is actually a blessing in some sense, because if you always succeed, you never get better. And I apply this to my surfing competition because with surfing, I'm so hard on myself. Like I would go out and fail on what I try to do. And I'm like, I'm going to quit. I'm not good enough to make the Olympics. You know, like I'm so, so much harder on myself because surfing is my life basically than bodybuilding. And I try to apply this idea that, okay, I failed, but what did I learn today? Okay. And since I started doing that, everything has gotten better. Like I'm more patient with myself. I train better, you know, like even if I have a bad week, I know I'm equipped now to handle it. Whereas before it wasn't the case. Wow. So bodybuilding has really supported you in, I guess, resilience building. Yes. I can do hard things and I can get better. And I I see bodybuilding. I don't want to say it's easy, but it's easier to progress than surfing, for example, mm. or life in general, you know, like, I feel like life's hard, you know, like things happen yeah. and bodybuilding is more measurable. You're like, okay, what can I do today to get better? I can meet my macros. I can get to the gym. So like, it's very measurable and you can see that small successes that may not be visible at the end of the day, they're visible in six months. So once you've gone through this process, you know that, okay, if I do the things in six months, I will be better because I've seen it. So then you take this idea and apply it to every, I mean, surfing in particular, because it could take six months where you're failing at something at surfing and see nothing. Mm -hmm. And you just have to believe. So you can take this and be like, in six months, I'll come back to it and reassess if I got better. Or in life, like I have it. One of my main goals is, I know that sounds strange, is to be a better person. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Uh, but by working on myself, so I can be a better wife, you know all of that stuff, independent of what others do. Mm. And this takes a lot of work because you have to actually be, all right, I was yeah. not right. You know, like I was doing this thing wrong. My husband or my friend or my family was right. You know, and what can I do that depends only on me to get better? And that also takes time. So if you're applying the same principle for me, I feel like success comes and without stress, like without anxiety if that makes sense, because you believe. Oh, yeah, that's a great point. I really like how you said you want to be a better person independent of what others do. And what that makes me think of is like kindness, even in the face of challenges, like in a relationship, arguing or having yeah. difficulties, but still showing love, still showing respect or in a challenging time where a friend really needs you being there for them, even if it means you need to give up something that is important to yeah. you. So I think that's a really great point. And you also said bodybuilding has supported you in exemplifying getting better in these other areas, but bodybuilding is more of a calculated way mm -hmm. of getting better because you do have a lot more things, I guess, within your control, but also you cannot improve or progress unless you have failures and it reminds me of yeah. this one of my favorite quotes is the fool precedes the master and mm -hmm. that's by jordan peterson he has a speech 
well, not a speech, but there's like a little clip you guys can listen to if you want to look it up called that, but um, it's great. And it's, it's a great reminder that if you want to master something, you have to first be willing to fail and be yeah. foolish at this it. This is my number one, like failure. I love failure. And I don't want to, you know, say like, don't take it their own way. I love success. Of course, yes. <laughs> but I love failure. Now, every time, like, and I think that's due to bodybuilding. Every time I fail at anything, like I have an argument with my husband. I was like, oh, I did not handle this right. Or I try something new at surfing and I could not land an air or whatever it is. I'm like, okay, this is good. I'm mm -hmm. happy. You know, and I never felt like this before bodybuilding. Which I, for me, it's like the number one, you know, I would never quit bodybuilding because of that, you know? Absolutely. Even like when you consider some of the cons that you listed, a lot of that is more so like um, choices that someone can make in the sport or maybe perceptions as well. I mean, obviously we can't choose whether or not we put makeup on on stage, which right, yeah. I'm with you on that girl. I yeah. do not. I don't ever wear it. And so then on stage, I'm like, oh, I, yeah. I feel like I just don't look like myself. Um, so I can understand that. And and then it's a whole thing. Like my it face has like a paste. And I'm exactly. like, I feel so hot. Like, I, what is this? Exactly. <laughs> I can't do this. That, say it makes me a little bit itchy. Like I remember my yeah. first show, I like accidentally just started scratching my face and I was like, oh no, I ruined it. So I had to go get it done literally right before I went back out there. So I get it. But those pros really outweigh it. And I always think about how, like the bodybuilding show itself, like to compete in a competition, it's what maybe, I mean, I, we've seen people do it multiple times a year, of course, but for a lot of competitors, they only step on stage maybe once or twice in a year. The thing that counts is that every single day commitment and you are navigating not just bodybuilding, but also surfing and family and your job. So how, let's start with how you navigate just two different competitive sports at once, because I imagine there's got to be a concern for fuel recovery, yes. how you manage yeah. your energy, yeah. your time. So walk us through that. Oh my God. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, I want to preface this by saying a huge thank you to my coach, Jamie De Bernard from Fit Body Fusion. She, I mean, I don't, I don't even have words to say like I've had coaches that were all great like I have from every coach I had like um high you know high um profile coaches mm -hmm. that I learned something from each of one of them and they were all great however I feel like not every coaching approach works for every person and nobody until Jamie was able to truly take into account the fact that I do another competitive sport so for example I'm going to start with the positives of this um, prep for universe where I got my pro card because yep. I've done universe last year and so on. And I'll talk about this. Um, I think a week and a half before universe, I had to fly to Switzerland for five days to train with my surf coach in the wave pool, uh, which is like, you know, three to six hours training a day, like super. I mean, going to the gym is nothing compared to surf training in terms yeah. of energy expenditure. Like my watch says 2000 calories active burn a day when I surf, you know, train wow. and like 30 K steps or something, you know, it's crazy. Um, and I was like a week and a half out from my national show, flying to Switzerland, jet lag, all of that training every day, learning a new thing, which requires a lot of power. It's like airs where you get off the wave and try to land it. Uh -huh. So it's not like a casual, it's like a lot of power. Um, and I was, you know, low-ish calories of course had to go to the gym you know all of that stuff but the thing that we did with Jamie from the beginning of this prep which nobody else has managed to do this for me because probably nobody else has a pro surf you know like in their roster and it's just like it doesn't work for everybody is that we had zero cardio this whole prep so zero, unless like the surf was flat for a week and then just like walk 30 minutes on incline treadmill you know but literally this whole prep I had zero cardio and she's like please do not move more <laughs> you, you, you need to, to not move you know just like do your surfing and just don't do anything else um so that was really like she focused on trying to make me successful in what I cared most about 
Mm And my calories never got super low. Whereas in other preps, I was 800 calories, you know, 1,000 calories. This prep, I think my lowest was 14 for two weeks. And then it was like 16, 17, which is like normal food for most people, but for my activity level. And the That's other thing not is very like, high for your activity level. No, but you right? know, it's like, like per prep is like, eight. yeah, exactly. <laughs> prep is like super high. I'm like a hundred yeah. pounds on stage, you know, like it's not that I'm a big person, I'm five, three. Yeah. So yeah. It, for my body is like normal food for everyday people, you know? Exactly. Um, but the thing like she did that I did not even, I was almost nervous because like my skin, my weight wouldn't be dropping. And it's like, yeah, uh, we need to lose some body fat, but calories are, are the same. So she never lowered my calories unless absolutely necessary. Like I think two weeks out or something. Uh So my, and my labs were great. You know, like my doctor, my doctor had to pull me out of prep last year because I had no hormones left. My thyroid, you know, I had Uh a lot of health issues. I was also staying lean for very long because I did shows with a lot of time in between. So that didn't help. Uh And I think my body didn't handle that staying like this for so long very well but this time you know my my labs were almost like off-season labs wow that's great three weeks out um so and I was nervous that I'm not going to be ready because I'm like okay I'm not starving like I'm not I had (laughs) full energy to do like I didn't feel any anything got compromised but I feel like for a coach to do that is very difficult because to see someone that needs to lose four pounds of body fat in three weeks and not lower their calories. Like, I feel like that takes a lot of guts. Mm-hmm. But I feel like Jamie prioritized what she thought was important to me by being confident that she can get me ready. And she did. And I don't know how she did it. Like, I honestly, like, if I was a coach, I would follow the approaches of my other coaches that I have no issue. You know, as I said, they were all great. But I feel the approach was more traditional that would apply to 99.9% of the athletes that don't do another competitive sport. And I would freak out as a coach. I'd be like, this person needs to lose weight. Like, we need to lower their calorie. I would not be able to do what Jamie did. Uh, So to answer your question, with this prep, it has not been hard for me. I mean, of course, there are days that I would rather have more energy, but it hasn't been hard for me to, to do both. However, other times, like I had to compete in the world championship three weeks out last year. And that was a little difficult. I bet. Because I had to do an hour cardio on top of my six hours to eight hours a day of surfing. And that was a little taxing for me. I think that's part of the reason why, you know, my body stopped uh, working. And I didn't do very well in the world championship last year. I did much better this year. Um, I guess we're two spots from qualifying for the Olympics. So that's so awesome. Yeah. So it's hard. And you know, there are days that is very hard. I'm not going to lie. There are days that I go out surfing and I'm like, I cannot do this. Like I cannot move and my surfing is compromised, but that's, I think like in off season, that should not be a problem. So it's just like, sometimes I have to make a decision and be like, okay, these four weeks, Surfing is going to take second, but the rest of the year, you know, surfing is going to be first. Yeah. Well, my head's going a few different directions. So let me first ask, what makes it worthwhile to sometimes put surfing second when you do have that goal? Um, I feel like I don't feel like four weeks or whatever it is. And I don't put it second in the sense I still go surfing every day. And I still do my best, but I realize my best is 80% and not 100. So Mm -hmm. I don't feel like that takes a lot out of, you know, surfing is like a a long game process. It's like, okay, if for four weeks a year you don't go to the gym, your bodybuilding journey won't be compromised. And it's the same. If for four weeks out of the year surfing is second, like nothing will basically change, I feel like. Like it's not that I do it all the time, you know. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I, and I think a lot of athletes actually feel like if they're not solely focused on competing, then they won't be successful. You're clearly proof that this is not the case in both sports that yeah. you compete in. And now, like, so, for example, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. 
in like actually tomorrow I leave for two months and I'm going to be living on a boat in Indonesia with like no reception, you know, no Wi-Fi, no gym, wow. like no food prep, you know, like nothing, which I do often, you know, like I do the surfing, yeah. it's a surf trip. Uh, so we we live at the boat by the wave and just surf all day. Like, and there's nothing else. Like we don't get off the boat. Um, so I'm completely fine not going to the gym for like a month, you know, like nothing is going to change in the long scheme of things. Like people get yeah, breast exactly. augmentation and they don't go to the gym for six months. Nothing changes, you know, they still get yeah. back. I haven't gotten it because I don't have time. I would love to, but I literally don't have six yeah. weeks. But I cannot. So I'm like, I, I guess it's never going to happen. But people <laughs> do stuff all the time. They get That's sick. Right. You know, and it's fine. Like nobody loses anything in this amount of time. Yeah, that's such a great reminder too, because I think we can get so caught up in the what if I lose all this progress that we forget yeah. that sometimes you really need to prioritize recovery or this goal or this area of life, or if you're sick, get better and it'll actually make you better long term. Yeah. And with that sole focus on one thing, I think it can actually work against athletes a lot more than for yeah. them because that hyperfixation, even though the world tells us, oh, in order to be successful, you have to be 110% in this. But I think that there is an important note here, which is you still need to prioritize other areas of life that matter to you in order to have longevity in this sport. So yeah. how do you personally feel like working towards multiple goals at once actually benefits you as an athlete? Uh, I mean, for me, Personally, I try to, again, I started bodybuilding, as I said, for fun almost. Mm -hmm. And for the longest time, I really questioned if I should be doing this. Like I almost quit many times because I'm like, this is not for me. Like, what am I doing? Yeah. I love being outdoors. I don't want to go to the gym, you know, <laughs> like, I mean, I move. My average steps are 20K a day because I'm outdoors all day without yeah. trying, you know, like not without cardio. So I'm like, why do I have to spend this hour or two a day indoors where I live in sunny California, you know, like I can just right. be surfing, you know, whatever. So I had this fight with myself for the longest time until like what I told you before ties in um, until I realized the benefits emotionally and mentally, because, you know, competitive sports are, yes, they're physical, but they're also mental. And if your mind is not at the right place, you don't succeed as mm -hmm. you know similarly if your body's not at the right place you don't succeed but i think it's competition in surface both like you have to be accepting failure you have to be navigating you know everything so once i realized what i have done mentally from bodybuilding i felt like it's an accessory for my surfing rather than trying to it's it's almost like complementing it so it's it's kind of like cross training for me mm. for surfing it keeps my body strong it keeps my nutrition healthy for sport and it keeps my mind at the right place to succeed so I don't feel like navigating two sports at once other than you know peak week or something and the travel shows which as I said is not important significant amount of time I see it as cross training and all athletes do cross training so yeah, for me, it's just one thing. It's like, I do sports, I'm an athlete. And this is, bodybuilding is how I cross train for surfing at this stage. I love that. I, I really think that perspective is awesome. And we can all learn from that too. I am curious, you know, you said earlier, Jamie really um, met you where you were at and provided you with coaching that you hadn't previously received that was really helpful to your process and obviously led to your success in going pro you had gone on that surf camp which also now my brain's kind of firing off another thought you do you know natalie matthews uh fit vegan chef on instagram oh uh, yeah yeah so and she works with uh jamie too last time i checked but anyway she was a professional surfer uh oh, she's the only other bikini pro <laughs> now that I, I know talk to her. yeah I have talked to her actually I don't know you probably yeah. she's so sweet um so you probably did if not you totally should connect with her um but anyway I was gonna ask you when you were peaking for nationals but you're in a completely different country 
what did that look like to travel back home and get adjusted and get ready to step on stage? Yeah, so for me, it's a little dif uh, different than other people, I think, because I travel so much. Like I would, in March, I was in Sri Lanka for five days. So, you know, I would fly to the other end of the world and come back home five to like 10 times a year. Okay. So for me, it's not that, it's almost normal. You know, it's like whatever is normal for it's And I go to Greece to visit my family twice a year. I go to a surf trip in Indonesia, Maldives, whatever. Then I go for trainings with my coach to the other end of the world. So it's like a lot of travel. So I'm almost like, it's completely normal for me to do that. I don't, yeah, okay, jet lag affects me and I don't sleep very well, but I pack all my food. Like I pack all my food, I freeze it, it's in my bag. Mm -hmm. I get an Airbnb with a kitchen. And, you know, just, yes, you have to compromise. Like I didn't go out to dinner with, you know, my coach and the other people in the camp, but I spent all the other day with them and took my meals with me. But somehow like, yeah, it's not very hard for me to do that anymore because I do it so much. That makes sense. You know, actually, now that I think about it, when I recently went on a trip with my family and the travel for me didn't feel as intense because I have been traveling so much that even though, yes, it was a longer flight, I almost felt conditioned for it, yeah. you know? <laughs> it's the same with everything. If you never go to the gym, first time at the gym seems hard. If you go to the yeah. gym every day, it's just another day at the gym. You know, so it's the same with, for me and long travel, it's just like another day in life. That's a good point. So yeah. let's talk a little bit more about like just your schedule, your life, and then we'll kind of talk about family too, but you're also a professor. So how do you work your schedule to support classes and training and traveling as much as you do? Yeah. So I'm like super lucky. So I think my journey is a bit backwards than most people. Uh, in the sense that when I was a little kid, I wanted to be a mathematician. You know, other people want to be, I don't know, something else that's more fun sounding. <laughs> but I literally just wanted to be a mathematician. And so, you're here doing it. Yeah, and I'm here doing So I achieved my dream when I was very young, you know, like this was my dream to be a successful mathematician and nothing else, you know. Cool. Um, anyway, so when I was very young, I worked really hard towards math, but I didn't see it as work, you know, it was kind of like we do bodybuilding, we work hard, but it's like, we want to do this or surfing. So for me, math was it at the time. Um, and so I got my PhD early, you know, like, um, I, I got like jobs after I got a professorship in my 20s, you know, I was like, super, like, I was done, you know, in my 20s, yeah. in terms of career. And suddenly, like, I had discovered surfing already. But I wasn't like full on surfing and slowly, you know, the surfing took over my math life in some sense. Well, I had some like really weird stuff happen from my boss, like due to discrimination. There's a lot of discrimination in my field really? um, like and what? like they stole my idea and they published without me and that hurt me in a lot of ways. So a lot of things happened at the time. But in any case, I was already successful, had a professorship job. And one day I literally like woke up and I was like, I'm going to quit and become a surf bum. Oh, wow. So I quit my career. I sold everything, my car, my bed, you know, my furniture, my clothes. I kept one backpack and one surfboard and traveled around the world by myself, like just because I wanted to be a surf bum, you know? Yeah. And honestly, like this is at the time was the hardest thing I've done in my life. Because, you know, doing the math or getting the PhD was hard, but it was like, I was on the path, you yeah. know, like that was, I was destined to do that. So it's kind of like bodybuilding. It's hard, but it's not, it will be harder to quit bodybuilding if you want to bodybuild than to actually do it. So for me, it was very hard to quit what I was destined to do and what I, from like five years old, wanted to do to pursue something that was new. Yeah. But something inside me told me this is what I'm meant to be doing. Were you already surfing at the time? Yeah, I was I was already surfing, but I never had time, you know, because I was working a lot. So I, I did surf here and there, but I wasn't like focusing on surfing. Okay. Um, so yeah, I quit everything, never intended to come back and just traveled around the world, like everywhere, like you know, Asia, Europe, um, you know, South America, Central America, Indonesia, Fiji. You know, I went like everywhere I wanted 
with no plan, like just pick the country. I was like, oh, the waves are going to be good there at that time of year. Went there, then booked another ticket when I wanted. And that was like the best thing I've ever done. Wow. Well, so that changed me. I imagine so. Yeah. How how long was it between I'm going to do this to I did it? A month. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> I like literally woke up one day. The next day I told my boss I'm quitting. And then like a month later, I had sold everything. And left. <laughs> wow. Okay. So now I want to know where your favorite spot you ever surfed was at. You know what? I love home. I love Santa Cruz. Uh-huh. <laughs> but it's not that it's the best wave in the world. It's more like it's home. Yeah. So if you ask me now, I'd be like, I surf at a, a spot called Sewer Peak at Pleasure Point in Santa Cruz. And that's uh-huh. my favorite spot. That's awesome. Yeah. And when you did this, this journey, and you said you used the term surf bum, does that mean like you literally don't even like have a place where you're living? Yeah. No place where I'm living, no job, no money. Like, <laughs> I mean, wow. I have savings. Yeah, of course. You know, because I had a high paying job. Like, you know, as I said, I was successful early. So I saved a lot of money because I didn't I didn't have any, you know, yeah. anywhere to spend it, I guess. I didn't own a house at the time or anything. Um a lot. I'm saying like 30k, like to last me for whatever, you know, everywhere. Wow. It's not a lot of money, you know, no. it's to live off of for a year. Yeah. Uh, but the countries, you know, I go is like, Indonesia is very cheap. You can spend five dollars a day and sleep and eat on someone's floor and eat rice and fish you know like so yeah. it wasn't and I found jobs like washing dishes at resorts or whatever surf guiding you know things like that oh. um, uh, but yeah interesting I what the question was <laughs> well I, I'm kind of just going in my yeah. own like world here when I'm listening so um, then it makes me think when you decided that or how you even got on the team and how you became a professional in surfing. How soon after going on this surf bum commitment? Oh, like 10 years later. It's surfing has been the longest journey, the most rewarding journey in my life. Wow. Um, and it has changed a lot for me because I mean, and most listeners are not surfers, so that may not make sense. But basically, my focus was big wave surfing. Okay. So my progress in surfing was to surf bigger and bigger waves. Mm-hmm. And in competition, you usually surf the opposite, so small waves, mm-hmm. and to try to do tricks on the waves, whereas big waves, you don't want to be doing tricks, otherwise you're going to get, you know, like, crashed. Okay, yeah. <laughs> you just want to surf, you know. So my kind of, like, progress for me in my mind, I was a completely amateur surfer, no interest in competing ever, you know, was big wave surfing. And I did this, I moved back to California after, you know, a long journey in life where I moved to many places and got many jobs and eventually ended up back where I wanted to be because I started in San Francisco ended up in Santa Cruz I guess Uh Uh, which is an hour seven so it's fine um so I I was surfing like bigger and bigger waves and then I went out to surf Mavericks if you know what that is like the really big wave spot where like you see these huge pictures you know like oh okay okay um, got it I was like okay I'm like done you know yeah and then I moved back to Greece and no, like I was in El Salvador for like five months, a couple of years ago, uh, surfing, you know, just like for free. And they had the world championship in El Salvador concurrently to when I was there. And I knew nothing about it because I never cared about competing. Surfing was also not in the Olympics until oh. like last time in Tokyo. You know, that's the first time that surfing was in the Olympics. So nobody actually cared about, you know, national. Th- I mean, they did, but not so much as now. Yeah. Um, so it's a very new thing. So I was in El Salvador, the world games were happening and I was like, oh, does Greece have a team? And I didn't see anybody from Greece. And I'm like, how come Greece doesn't have a team? So I went back to Greece this summer because I go every summer to visit my parents and my friends. And I went to like a surfing place, island, where I was asking people like, do you guys know if there is a Greek team? So they put me in touch with the president of the surfing association and I started talking to them and they're like, yeah, we have a team, but there are no women in the team. I'm like, why are there no women in the team? You know? So it became my, my goal to like have equality in some sense between men and women for my country. So I was the first woman in the Greek team 
because I wanted this to be a possibility. We had to go through like the formal process and become yeah. members and you know, all of that. So I wanted to open the, my, I got on the team to open the possibility for women from Greece to compete in the Olympics, not for me to compete in the Olympics. It was like a completely like, I was like, I do big waves. I don't care about this. Yeah. The waves you surf in competition completely suck. Like I would not surf them if I had it at home and I had nothing else to do. I would not surf those waves most of the time. They're so yeah. bad most of the wow. time. Uh, so I was like, yeah, but at least I'll be there. There's going to be an opening. People can can come to me and be like, how do I get on the team? What do I need to do? And one day, like, we'll be in the Olympics, you know, so we have the option. And then slowly, you know, kind of like we went to three world championships with the team already. There's one girl in the team also, my friend Irini. So two women now are in the team. Awesome. And we're really good friends. So it's really nice to travel together. Oh, so yeah. that became super fun. I'm like, oh, I want to keep doing this. And then like, I still was like, okay, I'm just doing this to open up because nobody else can do it right now. And I'll do it until someone like a young soul comes and rips and like starts surfing and gets on the team. But nobody else could do that. So I'm like, I'll keep doing it until then. And this year on the world championship, I only honestly only found out because of a Greek newspaper and they were like, oh, there were two spots from qualifying for the Olympics. And I'm like, holy shit, we can do this. You know, so I was just like, it came to me completely as a surprise that this is even a possibility. But since it is a possibility, I don't see why not. Yeah. You know, yeah it's a big dream and it may never happen, but the things I'm going to learn in the process, I think are going to be invaluable. So I am acting as if I 100% will qualify for the 2028 Olympics. And if it doesn't happen, I'm fine with that, you know, but yeah. for me, it's the journey that matters. Wow. That's so inspiring. Like I can tell that passion and that commitment to the, the principle of it, right? Like you yeah. want to have that space for women and you also want to get better, pursue it. And you're saying, I value the process. So whatever yeah. happens is okay, because I know I'm going to learn something through this. Now, what does it take to actually like get those two points? I mean, you, so the way it works is like with rounds. So you, you have a hit with four surfers and the top two pass the next round. Mm -hmm. And then the ones that passed get matched and the top two pass the next round. So it's a matter of like passing two more rounds. Okay. Yeah. So, and how many it's rounds gonna are be very hard? They're like okay. eleven or. So oh, more. so it's like limited. Their bunch. Yeah. So yeah. it's not that far fetched. It is very hard because, like, I'm not as good as you know most prof surfers that have no job. You know, like people that grew up surfing and they're mm -hmm. not from Greece, and like, of course, I'm not that level. But I feel like I can be good enough with the coaching because I love my surf coach. He's so nice and so good as a coach. Uh, he's like my Jamie for for surfing. Uh -huh. you know? yeah. um, and he helps a lot to progress very fast. So I don't see why not. I don't want to put limitations on myself. Because right. one in my position would be like, I will never do this. I will never be good enough. But I really don't see why not. Yeah, the door's open. The door is open. I'm just going to make what the best that I can and I can control the rest. And That's this is all that I want is to do my best up to wow. there. That's such a good lesson in, in life in general too. And it sounds like it almost parallels some of bodybuilding too from the yeah. earning the ability to go compete at nationals and then earning your pro card. And then the door is open where you can qualify for the Olympia or, yeah. you know, you can start to prove yourself, write a letter, maybe get invited to the Arnold, et cetera. So does your passion or desire burn similarly in the potential with bodybuilding? I feel like I haven't decided. I feel like I would be probably naive to think that the Olympics and the Olympia will happen at the same time not time, but same few years, you know, at some point to, to qualify for the Olympia. I mean, I don't know if I ever could in any case, but I would feel like I would need to focus more like a hundred percent at bodybuilding other than view it as cross training and just do it for fun. And at this stage, I'm not willing to compromise 
you know, I mean, not not to say that, um, you know, for example, I may need to take performance enhancing drugs to be more successful in Olympia. I don't know, maybe not, but I can't do this, you know, because the Olympics is a tested sport. Right. Uh, so you have to be three years clean, as the rules say. And I, you know, that's one thing I wouldn't be able to do if Olympia was my goal. I don't know if it's necessary. It may not be. Um, but other things is like maybe I need to train harder or spend more time at the gym, which I also cannot do at this stage. Maybe I don't, I cannot take these months off to go live on a boat and surf all the time if I want to qualify for the Olympia. I also am not willing to do that. So maybe one day, I don't know, but at this stage, I want to do it for fun and do my best and try to make the most out of it to achieve my surfing goals and have no other, you know, the YouTube would be road to the Olympics, not road to the Olympia. For yeah, me. <laughs> I love it. That, I'm so happy. Like, I love that we're talking about this and that you're being <clears throat> to share that story. Cause I also know there are a lot of pros who they go pro and then they almost feel bad to say, well, my goal is not to actually go as far as I can as a professional in bodybuilding. They almost feel guilty for feeling that way. So I love that you're sharing passionately your commitment to your surfing career and your goals there. And obviously having fun in bodybuilding, like, oh my gosh, yes, yeah. we can. Have, it's okay. Yeah, it's so fun now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and I, I hate the that. amateur shows because you never know when you go on stage. Yeah. So I literally told Jamie, I just want to be pro so I know what time to go on stage. <laughs> I have no other goal, you know, like that's all I want. <laughs> oh my gosh, isn't that so true? I remember what like my first show was in conjunction with the Bikini Pro show. And I was like, they got their own separate room over there. Yeah, yeah. That's like they're like celebrities. They get to have it and they didn't have to come to the venue until later. Like yeah, that's like so good. Like you yeah. know, when you get your makeup and like no wake up at 3 a.m. and <laughs> you know, it's just so good. Exactly. Uh, yeah, that's a benefit. Um, and let's talk a little bit more about your road to pro because I'm interested in hearing when you realized what a pro was and then what drove you aside from yes, knowing when you're going to step on stage. Like, was it just you were having fun and the natural progression was to go to nationals and then you just happened or was it like, no, I'm going to get the pro card? No, actually, it's I'm almost embarrassed to admit, but I will anyway. Um, I started bodybuilding knowing nothing. Uh -huh. And I did the original show knowing nothing. I was like six months into like some local figure coach, you know, like yeah. not a coach you would ever hear that prepped me for my first show. She was really good, actually. Everything healthy, you know, like no. Yeah. And I won the show, you know, it's like my first show. I knew nothing. Like my posing sucked. Like I had this pink bikini that like, was twice as large as it needed to be. It was just like a mess. You know, anyway, I still won it because I had muscle. I used to do CrossFit competitions too, as okay. cross training for surfing. So I had a lot of muscle already. Like yeah. I've been lifting heavy for 10, 15 years, very heavy. Like now I don't lift heavy anymore. It's like I was deadlifting 320 at like 110 pounds, you know, like that kind of heavy. That's impressive. So I had a lot of muscle. Like I didn't need a lot to compete and then I was like oh shit like I won what what now <laughs> I'm like okay we're going to to nationals or something I was like what are nationals you know <laughs> like, yeah. like, what is that mean? <laughs> like I have no clue um anyway so and then for me it's like I'm very competitive so uh -huh. the next thing was to become pro but I did not know what that means I didn't know that in pro shows you have a set time I did not know anything I was like, oh <laughs> I want to turn pro, you know, that's what I want to do. And I literally did not know what it means. I didn't follow any bodybuilders on Instagram. Really? Because I did not know. Like yeah. I learned that bikini exists two years ago. I didn't yeah. know anybody. I didn't listen to any podcast. I didn't know this world. It's just like a new world to me. Uh, and I actually got the idea to start bodybuilding because a CrossFit athlete that I admired did a bodybuilding show and I followed her on Instagram. And I was like, oh, since I wow. stopped with the pandemic like there were no more competitions but like maybe I should bodybuild you know it was more like that wow yeah so That's it's amazing. everything happened in two years for me and I had no clue what anything meant the only thing I knew is that I need to achieve the next step so it was more like a badge of honor rather than anything else and then I failed you know 
Yeah. And I, I failed, failed and I failed and I failed. And I was devastated. I'm like, okay, I'm not good enough. Mm. And then I was like, okay, maybe I'll quit bodybuilding. Maybe this is not for me. But something inside me kept going. And I think it's all the other stuff I talked about. I was like, I'm gaining so much from this in the background that I'm not willing to stop. And the other thing that for me, bodybuilding, you know, a lot of people like structure, but my life is a chaos. Like I buy tickets to Indonesia a day before I fly and I have to pack four boards. You know, like my life is chaotic. I don't see my husband for two months at a time. You know, I live at a moment's notice. I don't have plans. I cancel plans. I can't hold appointments because if the surf is good, I need to cancel my hair appointment. I'm not going to go to the hair salon. You know, I need like I've paid for appointments because I cancel them with three hours notice, like hundreds of dollars. I'm like, I'm there's no way I'm missing these two hours of surfing. You know, so my life is a complete chaos. And bodybuilding keeps me grounded. You know, it's like I at least I have something. Like I need to prep my food and go to the gym and I do it at different times in the day. Clearly, maybe I do it 8 p.m. or 5 a.m. or whatever. But at least I know I'm going to like do something that's the same because I was so all over the place for my whole life. Um, So that's kind of like um kept me going, like all of these things, like it, it gave me some like clarity, you know, just like, mm-hmm. OK, I can do something that's the same every day and not feel like I'm like completely up in the air. Um, so those reasons kept me going. Um, and then, yeah, so I didn't quit. But then I said, I'm going to quit or work with Jamie. Yeah. I kind of like followed her style. I was like, I think that style works for me. And they were like, oh, no, Jamie only takes pros. I'm like, OK, then I'm, I'm going to quit. And then I. Which I don't like, even I, I don't know. If that's true. Is it? I mean, maybe I now. now it, yeah. Cause I, that was like wasn't. in the summer or like whatever it was, like the fall. I'm like, I have to work with her. Otherwise, I'm not. And I told them, I was like, every month I was like, I need to work with Jamie or I'm going to quit bodybuilding. And then like after, I don't know, months, they're like, okay, fine. Jamie will like see you, you know? <laughs> so I insisted. And I'm like, I'm glad I did, you know? that. And yeah. Out. Um, yeah, but for me, just turning pro was just a badge of honor, I guess. Mm-hmm. And now it was more like this time, and I think I knew I was going to turn pro because of the way I felt. This time it was more like, this is fun. And I don't care what other people look. You know, I never, you know, before I was like, oh, she looks good and she looks good. I'm like, everybody looks good. Yeah. And I didn't like look at the people in front of me to be like, oh, who's going to win? Who's like, am I better? Am I worse? I'm like, I really don't care. I'm here with my team. I'm having fun. Vanessa was there. So we're like hanging out. You know, this is this is nice. And I was so calm and so collected. And like, I honestly, not that I didn't care, but I didn't care. I was like, whatever happens, happens. I did my best according to my constraints. And whatever happens, happens. And, you know, so now I just want to have fun. So that changed a lot the last year. I think that's so amazing. And to have that commitment to what I'm hearing a lot from you is the mentality is really important. And yeah. obviously I know this with the work that I do, but I mean, I'm seeing it in your journey that that mentality of I'm going to go for it. I'm going to give it the best I can. I'm going to know that I did the best that I could ultimately got you where you wanted to be, or it at least gave you lessons and insights that then eventually got you where you wanted to be. And you mentioned something that's just like standing out to me, which is sometimes you don't see your husband for two months at a time. And that your life is chaotic. You'll make that last minute decision, that last minute change. How do you maintain positive relationships with your family, given all of this? Have you ever been told that you can't heal your relationship with food unless you stop competing? Or do you feel like a lost cause because every time you've tried to heal your relationship with food, you're always met with the same challenges, judgment, shame, and guilt, but you're ready to get to that root of your relationship with food and really understand your habits and behaviors and make lasting changes that are going to drive you forward in your competition goals as well as your life. And of course, if you don't want to stop competing in this sport that you love, but you 
also don't want to continue down the rabbit hole that is setting you back in your life, emotions, and potential for success on stage, I want you to know that you can get through this. And no, you do not have to stop competing in order to do so. You truly deserve to have successful preps, productive improvement seasons, and peace of mind year round. Because when your head is full of thoughts of food, eating, or guilt, you cannot invest that energy into the goals you truly care about which is a big reason why I launched the five-week food relationship program and why it has been my most highly demanded program to help competitors like yourself make peace with food so they can pursue the sport they love for the long run without having to worry about sacrificing their mental health. If you want to learn more about this program and hear from others who have done it, then visit www.celestial.fit slash foodfreedom. Scroll through that page, get some information, and if you're inspired and you are ready to take action on this, go ahead and apply to work with me, and I will be getting back to you within 24 to 48 hours to go over your application and discuss your concerns specifically to determine if and how I can support you. Again, that is at www.celestial.fit slash foodfreedom. Yeah, <laughs> that's a hard one. So there, with my husband specifically, I don't have like, I have two chickens and my husband here and my parents are in Greece. So that's my family. Yeah, I love that you have chickens, by the way. I love my chickens. They're so cute. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's a white one and a yellow one. And they're the cute. <laughs> like, I love them so much. Anyway, I love my husband too. If yeah. <laughs> it's like, I love the chickens and their husband. <laughs> Uh, anyway. well see it's because I didn't say I love that you have a husband too yeah, yeah, we were exactly. talking about the chickens don't worry um anyway but um it's been rough for many reasons it's it was rougher before than now um and I don't want to go in our relationship we've been together for 12 years married for six um mm-hmm. and I love him to death like I hope we're all together forever you know like I Aww. have no uh, desire to ever not be together but you know you never know what life brings and so on and so forth um but our relationship has not been linear you know it's been very up and down and a lot of it was because I was a different person I mean some of it is because of my chaotic lifestyle a lot of it is because I was a different person like I'm a very selfish person you cannot not be selfish and do these things you know you have to have your time I spend a lot of time by myself and I love it and I like I want to travel by myself and I want to surf by myself and I want to go to the gym by myself and I don't want to talk to I'm I'm antisocial like I don't want to talk to anybody sometimes for days you know and I love my friends and I love everything that's in everyone that's in my life I just sometimes I just don't want to talk yeah you know at all (laughs) that might last for a week you know it's okay (laughs) and it's fine um but yeah so I was a very different person, very selfish and very set in my ways in what I thought was right and wrong. And I feel like that kind of like clashed a lot with what he thought was right because we're very different people. Like I think two people so different as me and him would never be together if my personality was not that what it is. Yeah. Because I see a problem and I'm like, okay. I mean, it wasn't always like that, but I think like I finally with therapy and thinking and applying principles from bodybuilding and other things to myself, as I said before, is like, okay, what is up to me to do? How can I work the hardest possible to achieve this important thing to me? Because my husband is important to me. So, and I'm not perfect still, of course, but now when we have an argument, I'm like, Okay, I feel like I'm right, but am I really right? This is the first question I ask. And yes, maybe I get upset, but then I leave the room. And my first thought is not, oh, he did this or whatever. It's more like, he did this and I feel like it's wrong, but is it really wrong? Or am I coming from a place where I don't see where he's coming from? And so I take into account his personality and what he means. And a lot of the arguments have now like we we don't really argue much you know like anymore because maybe if something starts I'm I ask this question and then I'm like I I'm fully prepared to see where he's coming from even if that's not what I would have done immediately but I want to treat him as he comes from a place of love 
And what he's expressing right now is more so his style rather than he doesn't love me or he doesn't care or something. It's like, you know, he, everybody has their issues, I guess. And maybe he's upset at work or whatever it is. And what he's expressing, it used to be that my first reaction is like, he doesn't love me or, you know, he yeah. he's mean or something. And now it's more like, what is going on in his brain? What is going on in his life? that made him upset was it me was it something else and he's taking out on me does he need space or time so I feel like once I was able to do this because I honestly feel not many relationships get to this point where partners do this and if they do it's hard to break them mm -hmm. so the relationships that get to this point from partners even though we spend months apart I feel like it's value in the other stuff is so great that, you know, the months that we spend apart are going to be like a small thing in the big picture. Yeah. That's what I think. So that being said, I do want to preface, he hates bodybuilding. <laughs> so Yeah, that's <laughs> so interesting. Yeah, he absolutely hates, he used to, I mean, he still hates it, but he used to like absolutely hate it and like hate that I do it and like always like, no, make me feel bad about it, but kind of like always say something about it and yeah so I almost had to hide you know like if I'm tired I can show it if I have to pretend like I'm not hungry or you know all of that. I felt like this I don't know if he wanted me to do this or not it's just like my reaction to it and he doesn't come to my shows you know like he doesn't he doesn't want pictures from my shows he doesn't want to be involved in this as much as possible wow. and I leave him out of this yeah and I understand where he's coming from because the things that I hate about bodybuilding are the things that he thinks that all of bodybuilding is. Oh, okay. And I would hate it too, you know? Like if that's all it was. It was like some vain people trying to build as much muscle as possible or something, you know? I think he has like still in his mind like the guys pumping iron at the gym that want to <laughs> look a certain, you know, this kind of like this, this picture yeah. that, yeah, I would not be doing it either if it wasn't for everything else wow so How I see you... where he's coming from but it's difficult for me because yeah. it, it is a big part of my life and I feel like I have I mean not so much now but I felt like I had to hide it yeah. even though it's not possible to hide it you know, I know. I'm <laughs> like how'd you do that yeah <laughs> so that was that was that was a bit rough I don't know if it affected our relationship or not I don't feel it does anymore and I do want to say I appreciate the fact that he's also trying to hide his detest for it now. So like, mm -hmm. I think it's a big step for him to go from hating it to try to actually, because I do it now so much to try to hide how much he hates it now. So it's no longer, yeah, he's not involved in it, but it's no longer like an issue really. Mm -hmm. So I think we both came a long way in, in Interesting. this. Interesting. When you felt like you had to hide it, um, did that mean you guys were like maybe eating less meals together or was that? No, I mean, I didn't, I felt like I had to hide it. It's not that I did hide it because you can't hide. We live together, you know, like we yeah. eat dinners together. So it, it was the same. It was just like, maybe sometimes like I had no energy to do anything, but it's like, you want to go on a bike ride? I was like, sure. Yeah, let's go on a bike. So yeah. it was more like I wouldn't show how hard it was for me and I wouldn't ask for that support because yeah. I know that it would be a issue you know like a, a sticky point so I tried to pretend to be as normal as possible I mean it's not normal and you cannot pretend <laughs> at some point unless you move somewhere else and like eat by yourself for like the prep um but as much as I could you know for and sure. now it's less of an issue because I'm also not that tired so yeah now it's easier yeah much better approach and I think there's probably others who are listening to this who are like, yeah, my husband doesn't support this at all. And he always has something negative to say about it. Did you, you know, I'm hearing your, your, your ability to not take things personally has shifted a lot. So you went yeah. from, oh, he's being mean to me. He doesn't love me to what's his perspective. So how did you get to that mindset where you could consistently consider his perspective so that you weren't likely to take it personally or see it as an attack on you so we had like a really rough patch during covid like everybody 
because I was gone for like six months or something. Like I literally went surfing, you know, at Co. I was like in on a boat somewhere, you know, uh-huh. and did not take him into account at all. And COVID was a hard time because he also didn't have friends to socialize with. Nobody was socializing. So he was at home. I was gone. Anyway, we went through a very rough part and I take full responsibility for that because I was also confused and I I wasn't grounded in any way. I was like insecure about myself, you know, I was selfish. Like I wasn't a good person. I, I mean, not that I wasn't a good person. I just like, it was you not who you wanted to be. Who I, what, who I wanted to be. And then I was like, we had like a really rough path and it kind of woke me up and I was like, okay, I need to make this better. And how do I make this better? Like with everything, it depends on me. I cannot expect him to make it better because this is my fault. Mm-hmm. So that was like the catalyst, I guess. Um, and then like, you know, I tried therapy. I still talk once a month to someone to, to keep me grounded. Um, and honestly, like there's like this account on Instagram that I follow, the holistic psychologist. Uh-huh. I don't know if you know her. Yeah. And she posts very insightful bullet points. So someone, my friend of mine told me about her and then I started reading and I'm like, this makes sense. So basically, honestly, my therapist and her helped that. me get a different perspective because I trust the experts, right? Like Mm -hmm. I'm a professor in math. If my students don't trust what I teach them, like who will they trust? So Mm -hmm. in in matters of the soul, whatever the, whatever you call it, I trust the experts, not myself. So like I trusted the experts. I trust my surf coats for surfing and Jamie for bodybuilding. Similarly, I trusted what they said to be true. And that and I think a lot about things because that's my job. You know, like my job is to think. I literally yeah. sit on a whiteboard. Like my job is to sit in front of a whiteboard and think. Like, <laughs> yeah, my day job. Um. Anyway, so I thought. And by thinking, things made sense. I'm like, this is what I did wrong. This is what I did right. This is what needs to happen for this to get better. So that was the solution I found. And then I really realized it depends on me. Mm-hmm. I mean, not everything depends on me, but whatever doesn't depend on me. If you had some issues that I could like, cross my boundaries, then that wouldn't work clearly. But I have not found issues that cross my boundaries in a way that you know this wouldn't work. So the rest depends on me. So I like having boundaries, but I also like being responsible for my relationships. Definitely. I think that personal responsibility is so key to getting through life in general because a lot of times we think oh well it's all on them or they should have known or they should have done this or well they said but we forget to do the part where we look at our role in it and there's and I used to be the first like I yes you don't have to look at yourself in the mirror if you do that yeah, it's hard to look at yourself in the mirror. It's similar to like looking yourself in the mirror in prep. I'm like, I'm not leaning yeah. hard, you know, it's like the same. I'm not good enough. No, nobody says, that. I mean, people say that, but it's hard right. to say that. Yeah. So yeah, basically I suck. And this is where I start from in the most positive way. Yeah. This is like my default. And then it's like, how do I get better? How do I not suck? Basically. Such a good point. I feel like that's a constant evolution too. Like, I've done personal development work for years. And then as I go through different life experiences or relationships or things, I'm like, oh, this has now been revealed to me as an area that could use some TLC. Yeah. And another thing that helped me in general to achieve these ideas, I guess, or this change of thing is like, I feel like, I mean, maybe that's irrelevant, but maybe it's not. I feel like I never fit in to what I was doing and I always tried to fit in because you know I was a mathematician or like as a kid I was a nerd but I was doing sport and I was playing theater you know so I had friends and I was social and I had boyfriends in middle school but I was also a nerd so I didn't fit the stereotype and I always tried to fit it Mm -hmm. one way or another but I ended up choosing things to do that did not fit the stereotype 
from one or the other. Like I like to call myself, and that's like in quotes, not to imply I'm beautiful or not. It's just the beauty and the beast all in one. Love that. Because like we're glam up and then we're also like yes. Beast. So I feel like not caring if you fit in and not caring what other people think and just focusing on what you want and how to be yourself in every situation is like uh, kind of like clears out a lot of things and you can focus on the more important things like your relationships or your goals mm -hmm. without worrying like how how to do this how to you know even like I'm a professor in at UCSC I have students I have people I don't hide I mean, I don't use a fake name, bodybuilding, you know, like yeah. if they want to look me up, they'd look me up. It's just like, this is who I am. This is part of what I do. I'm never going to hide who I am again, because I feel that takes so much energy away from the important stuff. You said to be yourself in all of it. So when you think about being yourself, what does that actually look like or mean to you? especially in those difficult times? Well, I mean, I think like the one thing that I would say identifies who I am is that I do my best to achieve what I think is important. Mm. And whatever I think is important needs to be open and out there. So I'm not ashamed of what I do in any situation anymore, I guess. And I'm trying my best. So I think like, this is who I identify with. Just try your best. That's amazing. Yeah, I really, I'm really loving the perspective that you're sharing, especially from the personal growth aspect, interpersonal relationships with yourself as well. The way that you're navigating your life and how you have all these amazing goals and commitments. So what is next for you? Like what's on your radar next? We know about your goal, of course, to qualify for the Olympics. What does the next, like, I know you said you're going to leave soon for like a two month. Yeah, I leave trip. tomorrow. Tomorrow. Holy moly. But I'm going so to awesome. Greece first and then I'm leaving to Indonesia from there and back to Greece where my husband is going to meet me too. And Vanessa. Oh, in Greece? Yeah. That's awesome. Okay, yeah. good. I love to hear that. So, um, so that's next for you. And then after that, is it just, well, whatever, whatever presents itself? No, um, Jamie and I have some shows picked out. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. <laughs> We're doing the Atlantic Coast Pro and the Japan Pro. Um, cause I wanted to just go to Japan again and Vanessa will come as well. Good. <laughs> Vanessa is always there for me. Oh, Love you. you. <laughs> um, so yeah, mostly I'm really excited about the Japan Pro in November. So yeah, after this break, I'm gonna pretty much start prep again, which I'm excited about. Yeah. Oh yeah, that show too looked incredible last year. I remember I was like blown away by the production. So I'm excited to see you take that stage. Yeah, I'm super excited about that. And then, like, who knows? I, I probably have to take another break because surf season is in the winter here. Okay. Maybe do shows again in, like, May, June. I actually like... I don't like doing a lot of shows back-to-back -back because I like having the break. Hmm. But I also like living lean. Yeah. Because of sports and stuff. Like, lighter is better for surfing. So I like having them spaced out. To kind of, I mean, not that I ever, I mean, I usually I'm 10 pounds up or down at any given time, you know, like yeah. deep off season versus prep because I'm so active. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I like keeping the same kind of weight, I guess. Yeah, uh, that's awesome. Makes sense given tight. your needs and performance too. Yeah, it'd be hard to do it heavy. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And especially with the type of training you're doing consistently. That's something I thought about too. Like when I go into improvement seasons, I try to remind myself, like you're an athlete, you want to be able to be active and do things in your life without worrying about your body holding you back just because you want to grow or build. Um, it doesn't mean you have to sacrifice other activities. Yeah. I mean, life goes on in prep or outside and you need to live your life truthfully and happily otherwise 
why are we doing anything, right? That's so good. That's such a good word. Honestly, I was just about to ask you for your best advice. That might have been it. That was such good advice, but I'll ask you anyways. What is your best advice for somebody who's never competed before but wants to? And then your best advice for somebody who's on their road to pro. Right. So I have a few things that I think are important to keep in mind. And that applies to anybody that is an amateur or wants to go pro or competing for the first time. Uh, in terms of kind of like health and relationship with food. Because I see a lot of people in this industry, I guess, that are very fixated on food. And to be completely transparent, when I was 12 or something, I also had an eating disorder mm -hmm. that I've been uh, over it for a long time before I started bodybuilding and so on and so forth because I was focusing on performance and all of that. But I, I get it. I get how um, this sport draws people from walks of life that had something to do with eating disorders. And it's very dangerous in some sense if you're not doing it the right way. So I feel like my advice is that success, same success can be achieved with a hundred different ways. The first thing is to find what works for you because, you know, I was lean enough and ready for a show with 800 calories and hours of cardio on top of surf. I was also lean enough and got my pro card with 1400 calories doing macros. So if I, I mean, I don't tend to eat, you know, a lot of sugar or something like close to show, but I could, and I have, you know, and the, it didn't compromise my success. I feel like some people are like, okay, chicken rice, and asparagus, and that kind of be bad for your gut. Like I had gut problems when I was eating the same foods. I had hormone problems. So variety of foods is very important. Mm -hmm. And also like, yes, you can be successful being flexible and living life like, a, I don't want to say normal because I don't know what normal is, but living life like a happily and comfortably and not feeling deprived. Like I have chocolate in my reverse, a, you know, a square of chocolate with my cream of rice and or have ice cream if I want to, you know, and I don't do it every day. I do it once a week, maybe once every two weeks, maybe twice a week in the off season. I don't overdo it. I don't have cravings, luckily. Uh, but I feel like being flexible and being comfortable being flexible is important. Missing a day at the gym because you're sick is being flexible and that's important. Like listen to your body, you know, all of that stuff. So my best advice would be try to optimize your health because health is wealth and that's all you're going to have for the rest of your life. And if you compromise your health early on, this could be the end, the beginning of the end. Failure is not the end. Failure is the beginning, as we said, but lack of health is the end. Mm -hmm. So flexibility, many ways to do the same thing. Don't look at others. You know, some people would like to eat unseasoned foods. I don't understand that, but I support, you know, it's fine. You know, if they like it, great. You know, I like eating raw fish. Like some people don't, but do what you like and do it in the most comfortable way possible. Prep doesn't need to suck. Like, yes, it's going to be hard, but it really does not need to suck. And also be very mindful when you do the very personal choice of getting into taking drugs and stuff because these can affect women's health in unreversible ways that are not reversible. So this would be my two best advices for amateurs, especially, I mean, and pros, I guess. Again, someone that wants to turn pro, I'd say just what I just told them, do it for the right reasons, do it for the journey, do your best, don't find shortcuts. Like just, just immerse yourself in the experience because, okay, you turn pro and then what? Like, why is it any different? Like it's competing, it's bodybuilding. Do it for the bodybuilding. You know, you don't need to take any shortcuts. You'll turn pro and you'll do pro shows. Okay. Sure. There's a time thing that is better, but it's not that different. You're still competing. Take your time, build your muscle, eat your food, be comfortable, be healthy. Most importantly. And then turn pro, do the pro shows, go to the Olympia, be as successful as you possibly can be, setting the, setting the right foundation. All of that was so good and so important. And I really think that if someone's new to this or even been in it for a while, hearing that is a great reminder. It's a great 
insight into what to consider. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing your story and your passions and everything and your growth. How can people connect with you and follow your journey? Uh, Yeah, I mean, I'm on Instagram as surf underscore snow underscore repeat, because I also snowboard occasionally. Um, I should change that at some point, but now it's been so long. Um, So yeah, surf underscore snow underscore repeat. Um, I guess, uh, yeah, I don't have like a YouTube channel or or anything, or you can come to one of my lectures at UC Santa Cruz. That's awesome. That would be so cool. You can look at my website, you know, my professional website at UC Santa Cruz online, my publication, you know, whatever, my lecture times and stuff like that. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Or find me in the water. (laughs) If you're in Santa Cruz, come to She's probably out there. Yeah. I was grateful that you gave me this time today. I'm sure you're just itching to get out. So thank you for but the waves it. are flat today, so it's okay. Perfect. Good. <laughs> I scheduled call. It, like when I looked yeah. at the surf reports, like when can I schedule this in the morning? <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I'm glad that it worked out for us. And I'm so happy you came on and thank you again for your time. And everybody listening, I'm gonna put that information on the show notes page. That's always on celestial.fit slash podcast. If you are listening right away, it'll be at the top of the page. If you're listening, scroll down to the category section. It's alphabetized. You'll be able to find not just the links to connect with us, but all the notes, the episode summary, and the bulleted list of topics we covered, as well as timestamps. So uh, definitely check that out. Share it with your teammates, your friends, your family. Let them know what part stood out to you. And tag us. Let us know that you listened and let us know what you thought about the episode. And we look forward to hearing from you guys and, of course, supporting you in your journeys as you listen. And thank you all so much for tuning in. As always, it means so much to me. I hope you have an amazing rest of your day, night, or morning, wherever you are in the world while you're listening to this episode. Just make it awesome.